Now, that's an interesting quote, isn't it? I assume by now that most of you guys have had the chance to read it. So this quote was first attributed to Galen, who was a Greek physician back around the year 100 to 200. Most recently, however, this quote was used by Hoffman and colleagues in a publication in response to a previous article demanding the more widespread use of intravenous lipids. Now, Hoffman and colleagues are clinical experts in the field of toxicology, and they used this quote because they wanted to display their skepticism surrounding intravenous lipid emulsion therapy. Their reasoning was that we still don't fully understand the mechanism of action. The indications in which it should be used are still not really agreed upon. And finally, we don't have high quality studies in order to support its use. So when clinical experts in the field are telling me not to use a therapy, that doesn't really inspire my confidence. Now, what if I told you that in a systematic review in 2016, over 97% of patients who were treated with intravenous lipids in one specific form of toxicity had survived? What if I told you that in a different systematic review in 2016, over 85% of all other patients who were treated with intravenous lipid emulsion therapy in response to every other overdose ingestion had survived? Now, these numbers are a little bit more promising, right? What if I told you that the authors of both of these systematic reviews were the same authors of Hoffman and colleagues? Now, that brings up a lot of confusion and a lot more questions, right? And that's where I come in today. So, my name is Dr. Kevin Durr. I'm one of the residents at the Auto Hospital in Emergency Medicine, and I'm here to talk to you guys about intravenous lipids, the new fad diet. So my goal for today's talk is I want to empower you to use intravenous lipids in appropriate toxicologic emergencies. Now, in order to do that, we have a few objectives we need to discuss. So first, I want you guys to understand the background of intravenous lipids. Next, we need to define the mechanism of action and how people believe that intravenous lipids work. After that, we need to assess the indications as well as the adverse effects associated with intravenous lipids. Then we need to review the current existing guidelines. And finally, we have to take all this information and translate it into your clinical practice. So I want to start with the background. Now, I want to start with the creation of intravenous lipids, all the way from its conception to its use in clinical therapy. It was first invented in 1962 by a Swedish physician named Dr. Arvid Rettland. Now, it was originally created to be used as TPN, and still to this day, it's being used for that same reason. Now, we fast forward many years to 1997, and this is where Dr. Weinberg and colleagues identified the association of carnitine deficiency and bupivacaine-associated toxicity. Now, they had a 16-year-old female patient who was otherwise healthy, presenting for a routine procedure. And she presented and she received a subtoxic and sublethal dose of bupivacaine, 0.22 milligrams per kilogram to be exact. And following this dose, she developed unexplained ventricular arrhythmias. So they tried to study to see why she developed this problem, and they ended up discovering that she had a carnitine deficiency. So Dr. Weinberg and colleagues hypothesized that this carnitine deficiency made her more susceptible to bupivacaine-associated toxicity. Now, in 1998, the same group of physicians wanted to test their theory. So they sought to find rat models of carnitine deficiency in order to see if there was an association between carnitine deficiency and bupivacaine-associated toxicity. Now, at the time, they didn't know how to mimic a carnitine deficient state in animals, so they thought that they would inject these animals with intravenous lipids, and this would serve as a mimic. What they ended up finding was that in the animals that were pretreated with intravenous lipids, they required higher doses of bupivacaine to experience toxicity, so completely contradictory to what they originally thought. So they did more studies, and then they found out that in these same animals, the ones who ended up having bupivacaine-associated toxicity, those were, that were then treated with intravenous lipids actually had improved survival. So fast forward to 2003, they wanted to repeat these experiments, but this time in models that were more similar to humans. So they used dogs because they thought they were larger and were more closely relatable to humans, and they had the same findings. Those that were treated after sustaining bupivacaine-associated toxicity with intravenous lipids had better outcomes. And finally, we reached 2006, which is the first time that intravenous lipids were used in human clinical therapy. Now, the first case I want to discuss is in a 58-year-old male with a cardiac history. He was treated with intravenous lipids for local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Now, he presented for a routine arthroscopic repair of his rotator cuff. He was cleared by his cardiologist as well as his anesthesiologist prior to the procedure, and he was otherwise asymptomatic and vitally stable upon presentation that day. What ended up happening is he received a routine interscaling block with no complications. About 30 seconds after this interscaling block, 
the patient ended up developing generalized tonic-clonic seizures and then progressed to cardiac arrest. So they treated this patient as per normal ACLS guidelines. He received 20 minutes of uh, care. He was intubated, received multiple defibrillations, multiple rounds of epinephrine, as well as adjunct therapies, including amiodarone, and they were unfortunately not, they were not able to sustain ROSC. So when they were trying to think of other things they could offer this patient, somebody suggested using intravenous lipids. And within a minute or two of providing the intravenous lipids, they were able to gain ROSC in this patient. Two and a half hours later, he was successfully extubated. He was observed overnight and then discharged home the next day with no complications. In 2000, so the following year, we had the second case of intravenous lipid use in a patient that was outside of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Now, this is a case of a 17-year-old female who presented to the emergency department following an intentional overdose on her Wellbutrin and, and um, Lamotrigine. So she presented a few hours after her ingestion to the emergency department, and she was only altered at the time. So she was treated conservatively. She was then transferred to the ICU for further care. In her stay in the ICU, she developed generalized tonic-clonic seizures and then progressed to cardiac arrest. Now, she was coded, according to ACLS algorithm, for 50 minutes. She was intubated, received 11 different defibrillations. She received multiple different rounds of epinephrine, as well as amiodarone, calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. Throughout this 50-minute resuscitation, they were never able to sustain ROSC. They were trying to think of other novel therapies they could offer her, and somebody suggested intravenous lipids. Shortly thereafter, they were able to sustain ROSC in this patient. She was then transferred out to the regional PICU, and then discharged a little while later with only minor neurological deficits. Now, what is intravenous lipids? So the basic composition is that it's made of an oil, an emulsifying agent, and then triglyceride chains. Now, these compositions are going to differ based off of the type of intravenous lipid you're using, but in terms of your oil, you'll most commonly see either a soybean oil, a fish oil, or an olive oil. The emulsifying agent is pretty much going to be the same across all the groups, and it's typically going to be an egg yolk phospholipid. And in terms of your triglyceride chains, now there's two different types of compositions. You can have your 100% long chains, or you can have your 50-50 long and medium chains. Now, there are some animal studies out there that are showing that in those patients who are treated with 100% long chain fatty acids, they have better outcomes relative to the 50-50 cohort. So current guidelines will actually recommend if you're using your intravenous lipids for the antidote situations, you wanna make sure that it's a 100% triglyceride chain. Now, intralipid 20 is the most common intravenous lipid that we'll see in the antidote situation. This is made of a soybean oil, of the egg yolk phospholipid for the emulsifier, and of your 100% long chain triglycerides. In terms of the mechanism of action, now we still don't quite understand how it works, but there's a few proposed theories. And the one that most people seem to agree upon is the partitioning theory. So for the partitioning theory, there's two different subgroups. Now the first one is the one that I'm sure most people are familiar with, and that's the lipid sink theory. And what that states is that when you provide somebody with intravenous lipids, you actually end up creating an intravascular fatty compartment. And what this compartment does is it preferentially binds your lipophilic toxins, thereby removing it from circulation and helping clear toxicity. Skeptics to this theory will state that in a static intravascular lipid layer, it'll become saturated far too quickly before enough toxin can be removed from circulation to actually reverse your effects. So that's where the lipid shuttle theory comes into play. So the lipid shuttle theory actually takes this, the lipid sink theory one step further. Not only does it provide an area to bind your lipophilic toxins, it will actually serve to redistribute this toxin. So what it does is that it takes the toxin from the areas of high blood flow and the sensitive organs, like your brain and your heart, and it'll redistribute it to the areas for storage, like your muscles, and the areas for detoxification, like your liver. Now, there are other modalities that are also hypothesized, but these are, these are more so for secondary benefit. So there's the myocardial fatty acid theory, and what this modality states is that by providing intravenous lipids, you increase the concentration of myocardial fatty acids, thereby replenishing ATP stores. There is the cardiac contractility theory, which states that intravenous lipids can increase your intracardiac calcium stores, thereby acting like an ionotrope and improving cardiac contractility. There's your vascular tone theory, which states that intravenous lipids will directly inhibit nitric oxide synthetase, thereby increasing your vascular resistance. And then finally, there's the cellular dysfunction theory, which states that intravenous lipids will stop cellular apoptosis and reverse mitochondrial dysfunction. So now that we have a little bit of an understanding about the background and mechanism of action, I think we need to look at its role in our clinical intervention.
So the first toxin I want to talk about is local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Now, this is a systematic review performed by Holberg and colleagues, and this was published in 2016. And what they did is they looked at every single publication of local anesthetic systemic toxicity that was treated with intravenous lipids. So they did a Medline search, and they had 838 articles pop up, and they further selected that down to 113. In their search, they had 38 different animals and 76 different human models. In terms of their animal models, there was 29 randomized control trials, three observational studies, they had five case series, and one case report. In terms of the humans, we had 73 case reports, and we had one case series, which consisted of 10 different case reports that was not previously published anywhere else in the literature. Now, interestingly, in the humans, the ages actually varied from two days old all the way up to 91 years. So I want to start by talking about our animal models, and I want to specifically look at the randomized control trials. So the first subsection I want to talk about are those that compared intravenous lipid use to crystalloids. There was 15 total studies like this, and nine out of the 15 found that animals who were treated with intravenous lipids had better outcomes in improved survival relative to those treated with crystalloids alone. The next subset I want to talk about is those that were treated with intravenous lipids in addition to epinephrine relative to the epinephrine group alone. Now, there were six studies looking at this, and all six found that in patients who were being treated with both your intravenous lipids and epinephrine had better outcomes in improved survival relative to the epinephrine group alone. Now, this same benefit was not seen across all vasopressors. There was two randomized control trials that were done, which looked at intravenous lipids in addition to vasopressin, compared to intravenous lipids alone, epinephrine alone, or intravenous lipids and epinephrine. And both of these studies actually found that the intravenous lipid and vasopressin group had worse outcomes. Now, what about in our human population? So this is the statistic that I spoke about before. And this study found that 97.6% of cases in which patients were treated with intravenous lipids had survived. So 81 out of the 83 case reports. Now, that's not to say that intravenous lipids is the only thing that is benefiting their survival. 72% of these cases were treated with other medications while being treated, for while being treated uh, with intravenous lipids. However, only five cases, 5% 5 of cases, stated that they saw no benefit after the intravenous lipids were started. 71% 71 of, 71 of these cases stated that there was some benefit after intravenous lipids being used. The remainder of these cases either didn't report any benefit, or didn't report whether or not they saw a benefit following intravenous lipid use, or they stated that they couldn't reliably state which intervention provided benefit because multiple different things were being done at the same time. Now, like I mentioned before, intralipid 20 is the most common type of intravenous lipid that we'll see, and it was present in over 86% of cases here. So while this is a great study, there are a few limitations that I think we need to talk about. So in terms of our animal models, the generalizability is one that we need to discuss. So I'm sure you're all aware, uh, humans are physiologically different from rats, swine, and dogs. So in terms of us being able to use the findings from these different types of animals, relating it to our human practice, it's not always feasible. And secondly is the heterogeneity of these studies. Now, every animal group used different animal models, they used different local anesthetics, they used different intravenous lipids, and they had different outcomes. So all of this makes it challenging for us to use this data in terms of supporting our human patients. In terms of our human models, there are two big limitations as well. So first is the heterogeneity, like I mentioned before. These patients range from two days old all the way to 91 years. So their comorbidities are going to be different, the clinical circumstances are different, the type of intravenous lipid used, the local anesthetic used, et cetera, et cetera, is very different. So again, it makes it hard for us to use this to support our practice. And then lastly, the most important limitation is the publication bias. Now, what you tend to see with novel therapies is that when you have positive results, people are more likely to publish this as opposed to your negative results. So that could be what we're seeing here. It could be that there's a handful of cases out there of local anesthetic systemic toxicity that were treated with intravenous lipids that did not survive, but they were never published. And that's why we're seeing such a heavy skew in terms of the survival here. Now, what about our other toxicities? I want to start by talking about the highest quality of evidence we have available, and that's in a randomized control trials. Now, currently, only three exist, and there's a few reasons for this. So in the critically ill patients, it's hard to gain ethics approval for these trials. And then also, we don't see all that many critically ill overdose ingestions. So the first one I want to draw your attention to is a randomized control trial that was performed by Lee and colleagues 
And what they did is they wanted to see the effects of intravenous lipids in terms of reversing anesthesia. So their population was laparoscopic cholecystectomies with inhaled isoflurane, and they had 66 total patients. Their intervention was intravenous lipids, and their control was standard waking techniques alone. And their primary outcome was the time to recovery. Now, in their study, they found that patients had subjectively better quality of, of awakening as well as faster awakening. They had a statistically significant decrease in the time to eye opening for the intervention group. They also found that there was a decrease in the time to extubation as well as a time to patient discharge. But these last two values did not reach statistical significance. So they concluded that there was, in fact, a statistically significant decrease in time to awakening in the intervention trial. Now, there's a few big limitations for this as to why we can't use this in our population. First of all, we don't see inhaled isoflurane as a typical toxicity presenting to the emergency department. And then secondly, this was in the therapeutic range. So again, this is not something that we'll see in the ED, because typically we see overdose ingestions as opposed to thera therapeutic medications. So we can't use this to support intravenous lipids in our population. Now the next trial is one by Taftachi and colleagues. And this is a randomized control trial. They looked at all overdose ingestions presenting to their emergency department. So they had 30 total patients, and they treated all of, sorry, they had 30 total patients in their trial. The intervention group was intravenous lipids, and the control was just standard of care. Their primary outcome was the GCS score. So what they ended up seeing in their trial was that of the patients in the intervention group who were treated with intravenous lipids in addition to standard of care therapy, there is a statistically significant increase in the GCS relative to the control group. So they found that on average, patients would have a three-point improvement of their GCS if treated with intravenous lipids relative to a two-point two point, uh, increase in GCS if treated with standard of care. Now, this trial specifically has a few too many limitations for me. The first big one is that they treated all overdose ingestions with intravenous lipids. In their study, they mentioned that they saw opioid overdoses, anticholinergic toxicities, cholinergic, NSAIDs, salicylates, TCAs, et cetera, et cetera. So they saw a wide variety of toxicities, and they never specifically mentioned how many of each or how many was present in each group. So this doesn't really give us any information as to which patients would actively benefit from this therapy. The next limitation is that they only had 30 total patients, so 15 in the intervention group. With a sample size this low, it's hard for us to use this to support our patients. And then lastly, they use GCS as their primary outcome. While this is a great outcome for resuscitations, and it is important we need to continue to use it, it can be subjective, and different interpreters can have different values. So I think these limitations prevent us from being able to adequately support intravenous lipid use uh, based off of this study. Now, the last study that I want to talk about is one that was performed by Kavsnavi and colleagues. And this is a randomized control trial that was done in 2013. And what this one wanted to do is they wanted to assess the effects of intravenous lipids in your TCA toxicities. They wanted to specifically see the time to cardiac reversal as well as the time to patient recovery. So their population was all TCA overdoses that presented to their emergency department. And they actually had 108 patients in their trial. The intervention they did was intravenous lipids in addition to standard of care, and their control was standard of care alone. And their primary outcome was patient recovery. So what they saw in their trial was that there was a decrease in the time to cardiac ECG reversal, as well as a decrease in mortality in the intervention group being treated with intravenous lipids in addition to your standard of care. However, this did not reach statistical significance. So they concluded that there was no stati statistically significant benefit in treating patients with TC overdoses with intravenous lipids. Now, while this seems like a great trial, there's a pretty big limitation here. And it's that the information from this trial was taken from a 2013 conference abstract. So this is an eight-year-old study that was never formally published in any manuscript. The only evidence we can see is from a conference abstract. So because we don't have the publication to adequately assess and interpret, we unfortunately can't use this in support for or against intravenous lipid use in our TCA toxicities. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I want to take a quick break here, okay? I want everyone to get out their phones and open up your notepad app. What we're going to do is we're going to have a small quiz. I'm going to give you guys about 45 to 60 seconds, and I want you guys to think of every different class of toxicity that you think has ever been treated with intravenous lipids. The person the person who's able to get the most correct classes will win a small prize, okay? So your 45 seconds starts now. <laughs> 
All righty, everyone. So the timer is up. Now with a show of hands from people in the audience, who was able to identify at least five different classes of drugs that were treated with intravenous lipids? Okay, good, we've got some, some good answers. Okay, anybody able to find at least 10? Okay, good. Anybody able to find 15? <laughs> so we didn't get anyone for 15. Anyone for 13? All right, so we had three people for 10. We had Dr. McKinney, Dr. Drew, and Dr. Ahn. So I'll see you three after, and then we can discuss your answers to see who had the highest number. <laughs> so this ties, us, this ties us into the next paper I want to talk about. And this is a systematic review that was done in 2016, and it was performed by Levine and colleagues. And what they did is they looked at every single publication of overdose toxicities that were treated with intravenous lipids outside of your local anastemic systemic toxicity. And they found over 20 different classes of drugs that were treated with intravenous lipids. Now, for this, for this publication, they looked at your animal models as well as your human models. In the human case reports that they assessed, everybody had significant CNS and CVS symptoms, and there's actually a good proportion of them who were also in cardiac arrest. Now, all of these patients were treated with your standard of care management in addition to your intravenous lipids. So I'm not going to talk about every single class because 22 is too many. I'm going to focus specifically on the ones that I think are most clinically relevant or the ones with the, the highest numbers of case reports. And I also wanted to take a quick note to talk about the animal cases here. So I'm not going to talk about the animal cases either because like we discussed before, there are certain limitations in terms of us using this data to support our patient population. And also, there are so few animal trials that it doesn't really add much benefit to our discussion today. So the first class I want to talk about is your TCAs. There were 22 different case reports of TCA overdose toxicity. They were treated with intravenous lipids. 18 of 19 showed some improvement, and all 22 survived. Now you'll notice that there's a discrepancy between the denominator of both of these groups. And that's because not every case report commented whether or not they saw a benefit. So that's why the improvement section is a little bit lower than the survival section. And you're going to notice the same trend for all the remaining toxicities. Now, for your TCAs, the most commonly seen one was amitriptyline. And there was 11 total cases. All but one improved, and all of them survived. Next is your, bup your bupropion. Seven total cases, everyone improved, and all but one survived. The only one who died was a multi-drug overdose ingestion. In terms of your beta blockers, 21 total cases, 12 out of 19 improved, and 17 out of 21 survived. Now, I want to break this class down just a little bit more because there is three different types of drugs who are seen in high degrees. So you had six cases of propofol, six cases of metoprolol, and four cases of atenolol. For your propanolol group, three out of six improved, and three out of six survived, or sorry, five out of six survived. For your metoprolol group, three out of five improved, and five out of six survived. And in your atenolol group, only two out of four improved and survived. Now you'll notice there's a little asterisk next to the atenolol group. And that's because of these three classes, atenolol is the only one that's not lipophilic. So that could be the reason why we're not seeing as high of a survival in this group. Next is your calcium channel blockers, 42 different case reports, 22 out of 37 improved, and 34 out of 42 survived. And again, I want to break this one down a little bit further. So you had 16 cases of rapinol toxicity, 7 out of 15 improved, 14 out of 16 survived, 12 cases of diltiazem, 9 out of 12 improved, and 10 out of 12 survived, and finally 12 cases of amlodipine, 5 out of 8 improved, and 9 out of 12 survived. Next is our class 1 antidistrict mix, so 9 total cases, everybody improved, and all but one survived. Most commonly, we saw flacanine toxicity as per the overdose ingestions. In our anticonvulsant group, 5 out of, of 6 improved, and 8 out of 9 survived. The most common anticonvulsant we saw was, I mean, was uh, lamotrigine. For the diphenhydramine group, there was five total case reports, all but one improved, and all but one survived. In terms of your non-cyclic antidepressants, we had four case reports. Every case report was a venlafaxine toxicity, and all of them improved and survived. For our antipsychotics, 10 total cases, all but one improved, and all but one survived. And the most common antipsychotic we saw was quetiapine. And lastly, we have our cocaine toxicity. 
So there was four different cases of cocaine toxicity, and three out of four improved, three out of four survived. So this is a list of the most clinically relevant or the ones with the highest number of case reports that we discussed, specifically drawing your attention to our TCA, Wellbutrin, beta blocker, and calcium channel blocker groups. And the majority of all of these drugs showed improvement after being treated with intravenous lipids, and an even higher majority had survived. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, this seems like a great drug, right? But what about the adverse events? There are two different types of adverse events that you'll see. And it's whether you're using it in the rescue therapy for your antidotes, or whether you're using it as TPN. In terms of the rescue therapy, the adverse events are typically quoted to be minor and relatively infrequent. The most common one that you'll see is actually disruption of your lab analytes. So what ends up happening is that when you provide intravenous lipids, you end up creating lipemic blood. So whenever you're trying to get lab values off of this blood, you're usually unable to do so. Now, there's a few ways around this. You can try ultracentrifugation. It works sometimes. It doesn't work all the time, and it doesn't work for every analyte. And the certain analytes that will end up being disrupted are the common ones, your CBCs, LFTs, electrolytes, et cetera. Now, while this is only a transient problem, it typically goes away after six to eight hours, there are two case reports in which this has had severe patient outcomes. So the first one I want to draw your attention to is a case of TCA as well as Tylenol toxicity. The patient was being treated with NAC therapy. They drew the labs and saw that the AST level was low, and they felt like it was safe to stop the NAC. On a repeat blood draw, they saw that the NAC was actually elevated, sorry, the uh, AST was actually elevated. So they actually prematurely stopped the NAC based off of a disrupted analyte. The next case I want to draw your attention to is a patient who was treated with intravenous lipids following an overdose ingestion. And despite multiple different repeats of the blood, blood values, they were never able to get proper analytes. So they were never, this patient would, ended up being precluded from being an organ, organ donor because of this. There's been a handful of cases of pancreatitis that have been described in the literature, as well as a couple of cases of ARDS as well. Now, in terms of the cases of ARDS, these patients are typically critically ill, receiving multiple different medications and interventions, as well as airway manipulation at the same time. So this relationship is said to be more so multifactorial as opposed to solely causative by the intravenous lipids. Now, the next one is our renal failure group, and the same thing applies. These patients are typically hypoperfused. They're an extremist. They're receiving multiple different therapies and interventions at the same time. So again, this is thought to be more so of a multifactorial cause as opposed to solely causative by your intravenous lipids. And then we also have the obstruction category. So there are two different types of obstruction that have been defined in the literature. The first one is obstruction of the patient themselves, and then the second one is your actual medical supplies. So in terms of the patient themselves, there have been a handful of cases of DVTs that have been noted, as well as a case of priapism that has been noted following intravenous lipids. In terms of the medical supplies, there was a case report where a patient was receiving emergent dialysis, ended up having their dialysis catheter obstructed following the initiation of intravenous lipids. Now, I want to talk about two cases. While these cases are not specifically associated as side effects of intravenous lipids, I think they've had such severe and significant patient outcomes that it merits further discussion today. So both of these patients, within 30 to 60 seconds of being given intravenous lipids, actually sustained cardiac arrest. Now, the first case was a propranolol as well as the tiazem overdose, and the second case was a metoprolol and wellbutrin overdose. Both of these patients were exhibiting refractory hemodynamic shock as well as bradycardia, despite multiple different vasopressors and high-dose insulin. Intravenous lipids were used as a last-dose or last-ditch uh, effort to try to save the patient. Within 30 to 60 seconds in both of these cases of being provided intravenous lipids, they ended up progressing to asystolic cardiac arrest. Now, these patients were treated according to normal ACLS algorithm guidelines. The first patient had ROSC in about three minutes, and the second patient had ROSC in about six minutes. And both of these patients ended up surviving the acute resuscitation phase. Unfortunately, though, they both succumbed to their illnesses a few days later. Now, the authors of these papers have ended up concluding that it was a temporal relationship between the administration of intravenous lipids and cardiac arrest, as opposed to a causative relationship for the arrest. Now, what about in our TPN group? So the TPN group will experience the same type of side effects as our rescue therapy, but in higher quantities. In addition to those adverse events, they also have a subsection of their own. You'll typically notice adverse events with TPN are proportional to the duration of therapy, as well as the rate and dose of the infusion. So the first one is hypersensitivity reactions. Patients can get urticaria, they can get erythema, pruritus, et cetera. There's been a handful of cases of hemolysis noted. This is typically weeks into therapy, 
as well as a handful of cases of fat emboli, again, after weeks of therapy. There are a few case reports of patients whose ECMO circuit ends up being obstructed following TPN, and this is usually when the TPN is run through the same ECMO catheters. And lastly, intravenous lipids have been associated with an increased infection susceptibility. Now, what they've done is they've done randomized control trials where they compared patients who were receiving intravenous lipids as TPN versus controls. And they found that those at the intervention group receiving the intravenous lipids actually has higher rates of infectious complications than the controls. They tried to replicate these findings in their healthy volunteers. And what they did is they drew blood from healthy volunteers, they provided them with a dose of intravenous lipids, and then they redrew their blood. And they found that on these subsequent blood draws, their lymphocyte and neutrophil count were lower. Now, what about other warnings? I think we need to discuss the contraindications to therapy, our special population group, and the potential drug-drug interactions. In terms of the contraindications, the big ones are based off of allergies to the components of intravenous lipids. So like we mentioned, it's made of an egg for the emulsifier, as well as it's made of a soybean oil, a fish oil, or an olive oil. So patients who have severe allergies to these ingredients should be contraindicated to receiving your intravenous lipids. Similarly, because intravenous lipids is a fat, those with fat, sorry, with lipid disorders in terms of storage and metabolism should have contraindications in terms of receiving their intravenous lipids. Now, finally, given the associated increase in infection susceptibility, those patients with severe sepsis, sepsis should also have contraindications to receiving their intravenous lipids. Now, that being said, in the acute phase with refractory hemodynamic instability or with cardiac arrest, no absolute contraindication exists. It's up to the provider at that time to decide whether or not the advantages will outweigh the advantages of providing the therapy. Now, in terms of the potential drug-drug interactions, we found with studies that epinephrine in doses above 10 micrograms per kilogram will actually reduce the effectiveness of your intravenous lipids. So if you are going to be giving epinephrine, they, want you to, they recommend using lower doses. Now, animal studies have also shown that vasopressin can also reduce the effectiveness of your intravenous lipids. So current guidelines will recommend that if you're treating patients with intravenous lipids, you should actually not be using vasopressin at all. In terms of our special populations, we'll talk about the pregnancy population for a bit. So intravenous lipids are currently a class C drug in your pregnancy population. The only one that is class B is soya cal. Now, what about the guidelines? What do the guidelines say in terms of using your intravenous lipids? The first one I wanna talk about is a position statement by the American College of Medical Toxicology. And they published this statement in 2016. So an excerpt from their statement says that Given the uncertainty of its beneficial effect in human poisonings, it is the opinion of the American College of Medical Toxicology that there are no standard of care requirements to give or to choose not to use intravenous lipid emulsion therapy. They then go on to state that in circumstances where there is serious hemodynamic or other instability from a xenobiotic with a high degree of lipid solubility, intravenous lipid is viewed as a reasonable consideration for therapy. So the reason I wanted to start with this position statement is because it really displays the lack of consensus that we still have in terms of using our intravenous lipids. So what about with local anesthetic systemic toxicity specifically? So two different international societies have published guidelines on this. The first one is from the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland, and they published their guidelines in 2010. And what they state is that in patients who have, who have sustained arrest following, following local anesthetic systemic toxicity, you should be providing intravenous lipids. They then go on to state that in cases of hemodynamic instability, you should, you should consider providing your intravenous lipids. The second group is the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, and they published their guidelines in 2017 and then updated them in 2010. They have a 1B recommendation for treating your local anesthetic systemic toxicity with intravenous lipids. Now, they actually go a step further, and their recommendation is to treat the patients with intravenous lipids upon early symptom onset. So what they state you do is that you should start by managing the airway, and then you should start by providing your intravenous lipids. And their reasoning is that intravenous lipids have relatively minor side effects, and they're relatively infrequently in comparison to the significant side effects and patient outcomes of those with local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Now, what about in our resuscitations? When should you veer from your ACLS guidelines? Now, two different resuscitation committees have published their recommendations on this. The first one is the American Heart Association, 
and they published their special circumstances in resuscitation in 2015. They state that there is a 2B recommendation for using intravenous lipid emulsion therapy in your local anesthetic systemic toxicities. They then go on to state that in all refractory drug toxicities, there is a 2B recommendation to use your intravenous lipids in those cases as well. Next, we have our European Resuscitation Council, and they published their recommendations in 2021, so actually fairly recently. According to their guidelines, you have your intravenous lipids should be your first line in your local anesthetic systemic toxicity. In terms of your calcium channel blocker overdoses, your beta blocker overdoses, and your TCA overdoses, intravenous lipids can be used as an adjunct in refractory care. Now, all of this brings us to the Lipid Emulsion Workgroup. The Lipid Emulsion Workgroup is an, is an initiative by the American Academy of Clinical Toxicology, and they did this initiative around the 20 teens. What they wanted is they wanted to create a task force that would look at all of the available literature for your intravenous lipids, and then they wanted them to provide some recommendations about when to use this. So they sought out many different toxicologic societies across the world, and they had six different ones spanning from the States, Canada, Europe, and Asia. And part of these groups included experts in the field of toxicology, emergency medicine, intensive care, anesthesia, pharmacy, and clinical epidemiology. They reviewed all of the available literature and then provided us with some recommendations. Now, actually, the two systematic reviews that I spoke about before, the first one that was looking at all local anesthetic systemic toxicities, as well as the second one, which looked at all drug toxicities, were published by the Lipid Emulsion Work Group. In 2016, they published their evidence-based recommendations as to when we should be and should not be using intravenous lipids. And this is arguably the most important, the most important publication in terms of uh, intravenous lipids. Now, the way that they came together to make these recommendations is the group got together and they voted. They voted whether they would be in favor of providing intravenous lipids for certain toxicities and when they would be against providing intravenous lipids. They also provided with neutral recommendations. And this was either whenever they felt like there was not enough evidence in order for them to provide a recommendation or whenever they were not able to reach consensus amongst the group. They further broke this down based off of what type of symptoms the patient had. If the patient was in cardiac arrest, if the patient was hemodynamically unstable, or if the patient had non-life-threatening symptoms. Now, here are the recommendations in favor of using intravenous lipids. In your cardiac arrest patients, they would recommend its use in your bupivacaine toxicities. In your life-threatening situations, they would recommend its use in all other local anesthetics, in your amitriptyline, and your bupropion patients. And then finally, in your non-life-threatening groups, they had no recommendations as to using intravenous lipids. In terms of their recommendations against its use, in cardiac arrest, they would not recommend against using it in any, in any toxicity. In your life-threatening situations, they recommended against its use in TCAs, outside amitriptyline, lipid insoluble beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, cocaine, diphenhydramine, lamotrigine, and antipsychotics. The asterisk for your antipsychotic group is because of olanzapine, and we'll be talking about that on the next slide. And then finally, in the non-life-threatening situation, they recommended against its use in all toxicities outside your local anesthetic systemic toxicities. Now, here are their neutral recommendations. These are the ones where they could not reach consensus or they felt as though there was not enough evidence for them to provide you with recommendations. In cardiac arrest situations, they had a neutral recommendation for all toxicities. In your life-threatening scenario, your class 1 antidysrhythmics, your baclofen, your lipid-soluble beta blockers, your ivermectin, your olanzapine, and your SSRI had a neutral recommendation. And finally, in your non-life-threatening scenarios, local anesthetic systemic toxicity had a neutral recommendation. So they go on to further discuss in this paper their conclusion. And what they stated is that intravenous lipid emulsion therapy should not be changing your standard of care. They stated that in certain situations, when it's easier to weigh the advantages and disadvantages, such as patients who are arrested or patients who have refractory hemodynamic instability, or other patients where no known antidote is available, or we have no other therapies to offer, it's times like these when you can start to consider to use intravenous lipids as an adjunct. Okay, so I want to take a second quick pause here. With a show of hands from the audience, has anybody here ever used intravenous lipids for your toxicities? Thank you, Dr. Ho, for counting. <laughs> so we have only a handful of hands. So many people like myself have never actually seen it clinically used, so you don't really know what it looks like. I actually have 
an example of what intravenous looks like, and I'm just going to pass it around so you guys can all see. Now, it really resembles what you guys use for your milk, like the bags of milk, but I would not recommend putting it in your cereal. Okay, so now that we've discussed all of the available literature, how do we translate this knowledge into clinical practice? The most important thing we have to start by talking about is the dosing. So this is an infographic that was taken from the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, and this is their dosing recommend for local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Now, the AHA, as well as the, the AAGBI, have also agreed in terms of the dosing being weight-based. So they go on to state that in patients who are over 70 kilograms, you want to start by providing a 100 mil bolus, followed by a 250 mil infusion over the next 20 minutes. If the patient remains hemodynamically unstable, you can repeat the bolus or you can double the infusion. If you are under 70 kilograms, you start by providing a 1.5 mil per kilo bolus, and then you infuse 0.25 mils per kilo per minute. And similarly, if these patients remain unstable, you can repeat your bolus or double the infusion. Now, this is while this infographic was created specifically to be used in your local anesthetic systemic toxicity, it's widely agreed upon that this is the same dosing regimen you're going to use for all of your overdose ingestions. The ASRA ends up going to discuss when you should be ending your therapy. So there's no definitive endpoints to your clinical therapy, but what they state is that you should let the patient's response guide you. So they state that you should look at the clinical response as well as the vitals, and 10 minutes after achieving hemodynamic stability, you should stop the therapy. Now, the American Heart Association and the AAGBI actually go one step further, and they will specifically tell you what the upper limit of treatment should be. So according to the AHA, 10 mils per kilo, and according to the AAGBI, 12 mils per kilo should be the maximum amount of intravenous, intravenous lipids a patient should be receiving. If they have reached this limit and have not sustained hemodynamic stability, you should still stop the therapy regardless. I've also created a few TOH-specific recommendations that I want to leave you with. So the first one is that I want you to consider your intravenous lipids early. Now, I'm not advocating that you use it early or that you use it for every unstable patient you have, but in terms of dealing with refractory, unstable toxicologic patients, there can be, there can be a lot of delays if you wait until you need the therapy before you have it at the bedside. So this isn't something that we use frequently, so it can be hard to find in the emergency department. And if you're not able to find it in the emergency department, it has to come from pharmacy. Calling pharmacy takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So you can, you can ask them to expedite the transfer, but you have to speak directly to the pharmacist. And while this will be a little bit shorter of a time delay, it still is precious minutes in the resuscitation that you can't always spare. And the last potential delay is with our nursing colleagues. Like I mentioned before, this isn't something that we use frequently, so some of the nurses may not be familiar with how to, how to run this through the, uh, the pump, so they may have to refer to their binder to refresh themselves. So my recommendation is that it's probably safer to have this at the bedside early, regardless of whether or not you're going to be using it, as opposed to trying to search for it and having multiple delays whenever you might need it. On that same note, if you are considering using it, this is the time you should be calling friends. So poison control should be involved in all cases when you're considering using intravenous lipids. If you're at the general, you're in luck because we actually have a toxicologic service and it's staffed by pharmacy residents and they can similarly provide you with assistance and actually can come to the bedside to help you with dosing and indications. In terms of ordering it on Epic, now there's two different types of intravenous lipids that we have. The first one is intralipid 20% and the second one is SMOF lipid. Now SMOF lipid is specifically for your TPN patients. This is not the one you want. You want to get intralipid. Whenever you're clicking it on Epic, you have to uncheck all the boxes because it's going to be preset for your TPN dosing. So you want to make sure that you adjust it according to the dosage that we discussed before. Now lastly is the nursing considerations. So this drug needs to be run through a separate line. So if you're thinking of using it, you have to ask the nurses to get you additional IV access. And like we spoke about before, the most common adverse event is disruption of your lab analytes. So you have to make sure that you draw your labs before administering this. And it's probably even prudent to have an extra vial or two ready just in case you need to add anything else on. Now I can hear some skeptics in the back talking about cost. And I want to assure you that cost should not be prohibitive to its use. While I could not find the exact cost locally, by looking online, this cost's actually relatively cheap. It's about the same as a, as, a liter, as a half a liter of saline. So you should not let cost deter you from using this in your next unstable patient. And another consideration would be the expiration date. 
So like I alluded to before, we don't use this often, right? So you may be concerned that it's just sitting in the back of a merge expiring, but that shouldn't be a concern for you because technicians are responsible for checking these to make sure that none of them expire. So if you find it in the eMERGE, you can rest assured that it is not expired. Now, where exactly can you find it in the emergency department? So this is the Civic. In the resuscitation area, behind the clerk's desk, behind rooms one and two, on top of the fridge, in the antidote box is where you can find it. So I've spoken with Dr. Murray and Dr. Gilbertson, and I can see that it's a little high. So they've agreed to do one and two calls where they'll just stand by the fridge in order to get you the antidote in case you need it. And here's, the, uh, here's where you can find it, the general. So in the resuscitation area, again, behind your nursing desks, on the left where we keep all the procedural supplies, it's going to be in the top drawer of the tower. So I spoke with our local expert, Dr. Lisa Thurger, who's a staff emergency physician at the Auto Hospital, as well as a staff toxicologist for Pattis, in order to create some bottom line recommendations for you. And I want to leave you guys with these final thoughts. So first, intravenous lipids should not replace standard of care management. In local anesthetic systemic toxicity, intravenous lipid emulsion therapy should be administered early in the resuscitation. Next, intravenous lipid emulsion therapy can be used as an adjunct in your refractory unstable TCA, bupropion, beta blocker, and calcium channel blocker doses. The lipid emulsion workgroup will support your use in amitriptyline as well as bupropion, and the European Resuscitation Council will support your use in beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and all other TCA overdoses. And finally, in your refractory unstable or arrested toxicologic patients, a trial of intravenous lipids is reasonable in your lipophilic toxins. So I hope this talk helped you better understand intravenous lipids and empowered you to consider its potential use in your next refractory unstable toxicologic patient. Thank you. Do we have someone with a mic to run to the people with questions? Okay. So Dr. Ahn is asking why you should not be using SMOF lipid. So if you actually look on the SMOF lipid, um, so the, the intravenous lipid that I'm passing around is actually SMOF lipid. So if you look on it, it's actually 50% medium chain and 50% long chain. So the recommendation is to use a 100% long chain triglyceride. So intralipid is the one that you're supposed to be using. In situations in which you don't have intralipid, SMOF lipid is a fine uh, replacement. The recommendation is intralipid as opposed to small lipid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Wong had a good question regarding your massive beta blocker overdoses in the context of uh, refractory hemodynamic stability as to the concern about whether or not um, intravenous lipids will obstruct your ECMO. So while this is a complication that's sometimes thrown around in terms of your rescue antidote, the only times that we've seen ECMO catheter obstructions have actually been in the TPN setting. There was one case of a dialysis catheter being, being obstructed. So my recommendation in terms of this is that if the patient is in such hemodynamic instability, uh, specifically at our center, it's going to take a significant amount of time to actually get them to ECMO. So I would not delay therapy with intravenous lipids in preference of ECMO. I would start the intravenous lipids and then, you know, as use it as a bridge to ECMO if you can get there. I wouldn't, the, the evidence doesn't state that intravenous lipids will obstruct your ECMO catheters in the rescue therapy, so I wouldn't let that stop you from doing it. We have a question from Dr. Mock. I guess we got 
So Dr. Mark is asking about post-intubation sedation as to whether or not you would be changing your regular propofol dilaudid um, versus other things. So intralipid is interesting because it actually will bind propofol and it helps with the circulation and distribution of propofol. So in terms of my preference, um, I don't see these patients often enough. I would actually probably start with propofol, and if I'm noticing that the sedation is not adequate, then you could change to something else. Yeah, so Dr. Wilson is asking about uh, when you should be using intravenous lipids in terms of your algorithm for treating different types of toxicity. So the only one that I would recommend using intravenous lipids early is for your local anesthetic systemic toxicities. In all other cases, you should not alter your standard of care, and it should only be used as like a rescue therapy, as an adjunct in patients who are hemodynamically unstable, despite multiple different standard of care managements. So it wouldn't be something I use first or second line, it would be more so the third or fourth line. So I actually do want to comment on that. So in, in the literature review that I was doing, there was actually um, an observational study about glyphosate toxicity. And there was 22 different cases that used intravenous lipids, and they compared them to 22 historical controls. And they adjusted according to patient comorbidities, the dosing of the glyphosate, the dosing of intravenous lipids. And they actually found that patients treated with intravenous lipids had improved outcomes, I think in terms of the hypotension and dysrhythmias. So if the next time you see glyphosate, it is a, a potential use. Thank you for the comment. If we have no more questions in the audience, I do want to take this time to make a few acknowledge acknowledgements. So I want to start by acknowledging Dr. Miguel Cortel Leblanc, who's my staff supervisor. And this talk was uh, largely, largely possible because of all of his help and supervision. Uh, Dr. Lisa Thurger, who served as our clinical expert, who answered many of my questions regarding intravenous lipid use. We have Sabrina Natarajan, who is our toxicologist, or sorry, who is our, um, our pharmacist for the toxicology department, as well as the psychiatry department at TOH, and who also passed us around the intravenous lipids for us to see. Uh, we have my partner, Caitlin Kirby, who has listened to this presentation so many times, she can probably give it better than I can. Uh, and then finally, my dad, who, despite not being in the country, was able to attend this talk virtually in order to support me. <laughs> <laughs> I also do have a few supplementary slides about the animal models in case anybody asks, the further breaking down the human models as to which types of toxicities we saw, and then a list of lipophilic toxins, and then my references. <laughs>